and there was an opportunity, a position opened at Indian River State College. And uh, the former director of bands called me. He was moving up to a dean's position, and he called me and asked if I was interested in interviewing, and it was at the right time. And within a week, Mark, I uh, actually flew down, interviewed. My wife sent a couple of resumes out in the area, St. Lucie County, got two job offers. We accepted the job, and the second week, uh, we were moving. That's how quick it was. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode number 40. My guest for this episode is John Southall. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for your support. I'd like to ask if you can help me in a couple of ways. First, if you have suggestions for improvement or ideas for guests or questions, please leave me a message on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Second, please help spread the word for the, of the show. Tell your friends and colleagues to give it a listen. And finally, this is Midwest Week, and I hope to see many of you there. I will be at the CL Barnhouse RWS Music Booth when I'm not in a session or performance. Now, on to the episode. Hi, John. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. So, Down in sunny Florida at 42 degrees, unfortunately. Are you gearing up for Chicago weather next week? Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to it. I'm actually going to buy a coat. Oh, which nice. Which is totally out of order in Florida. <laughs> you use it once a year. Yes. <laughs> All right, John, could you introduce yourself for the listeners? Yes, I'm um, actually the director of bands and coordinator of music education at Indian River State College, and this is in Fort Pierce, Florida, which is about an hour and 45 minutes south of Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm also uh, the immediate past president of the Florida Music Education Association, and I'm also the proud music director of the Port St. Lucie Community Band. Excellent. Excellent. And so can you tell me a little bit about your origin story, where you, where you come from and how you sort of got to where you are? Actually, I was born and grew up in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'm, a, I'm a product of the south side of Chicago inner city school system uh, where I completed high school and um, very actively involved in music. Started in high school, actually. Um, ninth grade. An interesting quick story is that I was in a music appreciation class my first semester of high school, and I met uh, another young man uh, sitting with me in the class. His name was, believe it or not, he was an African American, and his name was George Washington. And George Washington was the tuba player in the band, and he said, Hey, why don't you join the band? And I did. And, and I decided trumpet was my instrument. I started in beginning band and I was in the top band by January of that year. But that is from very intensely practicing and loving my instrument. It's interesting. I had a fingering chart taped to my wall by my pillow and I would go to sleep and wake up, uh, memorizing fingerings as a young, young beginning trumpet player. And uh, from there, of course, I went down to the, um, I actually went to the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff for a year. And from there, I went to Florida A&M University, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, uh, finished my bachelor's degree, went out and did a little seasonal performance work for the Disney company, uh, went on tour for uh, several months with the Hippodrome State Theater's production. I think we did Chorus Line and uh, uh, several other musicals, and I played trumpet in the orchestra. And then I went and got my master's degree from Florida State University, Tallahassee, went out and taught for a number of years, went back to Florida State, earned my PhD in music education. Um, um, before my doctoral uh, degree, I was a high school band director at three different high schools, Ely High School, Piper High School, and for a long time, Western High School. And these schools are in Broward County, Florida, Fort Lauderdale area. And then I became music supervisor for Broward County Schools, Fort Lauderdale. And at the time, we were the nation's fourth largest school district. 
from there, again, I went to the doctoral program at FSU, and uh, after FSU, the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and then down to Indian River, Indian River State College in Fort Pierce, Florida. So I've been pretty much everywhere in yeah. my career. It's been quite a journey. I have lots of questions based on what your sort of biography you just gave. Um, yes. So I want to ask, is Chicago a homecoming? Do you still have family up there? Yes, I do. Um, a large part of my family is there, and annually I, I visit them. Um, and we, we, we all grew up pretty much very, very poor. Mm -hmm. And, but we were rich in all of the things that mattered in life. You know, Uh love, family has no financial price tag on it. Yeah, absolutely. But yes, and um, I've actually, uh, speaking of Chicago, do you realize that I have been an attendee on and off of the Midwest International Band uh, Clinic since 1975? As a matter of fact, in 75, I came as a high school reporter from my school and they allowed, there there was an allowance for high school students if they were reporting on the conference and what it was about to attend. And there I was sitting, um, you know, as a, I believe I was a 10th or 11th grader in the ballroom listening to performances. And this was back in the days when they used an LCD projector, not even an LCD, but a projector uh, projection screen of the conductor scores. And even as a high school student, I could tell when the page turner would sort of get lost <laughs> and, and scramble to flip pages to get catch up with the performing ensemble. It was a wonderful experience, a, a true inspiration for me as a young musician. Yeah, I bet. that That's an amazing story, actually. And so what was it about the trumpet and the band that inspired the 13 and 14 year old in you? Well, it was, I mean, I had a choice of a number of different musical instruments, but I think that I I was also a person who um, listened to popular music. And back in those days, wind and percussion and string instruments were very popular in um, modern day pop music. You know, when you'd listen to groups like Tower of Power, Earth, Wind of Fire, Chicago, you would hear the, those instruments, you know, there was there were very little digital uh, or uh, synthesized instruments available, and I think I was inspired by listening to some of the you know the top popular groups, and I also listened to classical music and in in high school, and I was inspired by the the sound of the brass instrument. Yeah, and trumpet was a popular instrument. For me in the time at the time because it was sort of an I hate to say this but an egotist instrument where you know all of the 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 guys I knew in the city of Chicago who were trumpet players all had carried their pride in their hands uh-huh. and they wanted yeah. the best of the best on the instrument. You must have had some exceptional directors along the way. Yes, in high school, I uh, Mr. George Page was my high school band director. And he was a phenomenal tuba player. Um, And um, I think he went to Lincoln University, Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, But he was just a true inspiration uh, because he was a a wonderful musician. And he had a passion for uh, wind band uh, instruction. He was also a a jazz enthusiast. So we had a, a wonderful jazz band at our school and performed all over the city of Chicago. And it's interesting, we were we had a program in Chicago that was depart that was sponsored by the Department of Human Services in the city that actually as high school students, we were paid a weekly stipend to rehearse and perform in our high school jazz band around the city over the summer. What a great opportunity it was for underprivileged students who were who were extremely impoverished to to actually earn income in the summer and again for me my paychecks went directly to my family I was able to help and support my family so it was a wonderful opportunity uh, to just play my instrument and be support and and provide some support for my family yeah that's remarkable John yeah so what was it about FAMU that attracted you was Doc White there well, when you were there. 
Oh, yes, he was. But here's <laughs> what the interesting story is. Okay. I was at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Mm -hmm. And this is a true story, Mark. I was in a trumpet lesson and my trumpet instructor shall remain nameless out of respect. Mm -hmm. We were playing through some literature and he said, you know what? Just earned my master's degree and you're playing as well as I am. You really need to go to another university. And I had actually seen the Florida A&M marching band at a Chicago Bears football game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I thought, wow, perhaps I'll go to Florida <laughs> and apply to go to this university that's so close to the ocean. Of course, <laughs> geographically challenged my entire life. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I flew down. And there I was in Tallahassee, and I was told, well, no, maybe the Gulf, but you are so far away from the ocean, son. You. And then it took me about a week and a half to realize, I mean, I sent an audition cassette, and I was immediately, I got a letter a week later, yes, full scholarship. And I, it took me a week and a half to learn that Florida A&M was an historically black institution, which was, I loved it, but I had no idea. I was going to a university in Florida that was walking distance from the ocean, which tells you how out to lunch I was geographically back then. John, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. You know that, Mark. I mean, with your Florida State. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I actually, when I finished my doctorate, I taught for a year before I got my first uh, teaching gig. I taught class piano at FAMU. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Just, just that. 2004 and five. Okay. Yeah. So I know some, Wonderful. Of, I know some of the folks yeah. who were down there at the time. Yes. And, and, you know, at Florida A&M, of course, Dr. William P. Foster and Dr. Julian White were my mentors, my inspiration. I mean, I, I modeled my teaching and my the struct, administrative structure of my band program after what they taught me. And, and in the band, I was a section leader and band president. So I took that entire structure uh, to my first high school program. And uh, by the way, I realized the, the, the true light of teaching and understanding that even though I learned and I came in and, and I even had a had disc files of all that I had done administratively as a college leader, that it was not completely adaptable to a high school situation. So I had to learn that lesson my first year of teaching is that that what we learn in our instrumental programs in college and, and we try to go out and emulate after college does not necessarily fit the, the uh, learning environment at a secondary school. You know, everything depends upon population and knowing the community, seeing where students and community members are and taking them somewhere. But my first year teaching was the complete opposite. I had an entire Florida a and administrative script that I was going to follow and it was going to be as successful as the college program. And it did not work. Yeah. There's, I have more questions upon questions coming out, John, but what I'm thinking about when you say that, do you have any thoughts about what we can tell first year teachers or what first year teachers should go into a job thinking? Absolutely, sir. The first, the first uh, suggestion that, or thought I have is that in higher ed, we are often challenged to be the end all of end all when it comes to educating young people, undergraduates. And um, it is assumed by many that when a person earns a college degree, a bachelor's degree in instrumental music, that they have all of the tools and they have all of the answers and all of the resources to be successful. And in my humble opinion, that's not necessarily true. In my opinion, the college education for an instrumental music person is quite simply to teach the person, to inspire the person, to encourage the student to continue to learn. You know, here is the foundation for your future growth, but it's a continuation of growing. Uh, and I think 
that mindset uh, should uh, uh, be the overarching uh, philosophy of all music education students coming out of a program is that we have a lot of information. We've been exposed to a lot, but we must use this as a foundation for future learning and future growth. The other thing I think I'd like to suggest for consideration is to learn about the population. Listen to the people in your environment when you first, uh, on that, your first few months in your position, because quite often uh, new educate, music educators will come into a position where they believe that they, since they have a, a certified degree and they pass the certification exam, they have a college degree, that they understand everything. But, but understanding that even though you have a strong background and you are an expert in many ways, that you have much to learn about the population and then the, the community that you serve, the students that you serve, uh, to be open-minded with, with, with examining what you're working with, the kind of students, their background, uh, what their lifestyles are, uh, what their learning styles are. You know the old saying that to to uh, to meet them some to meet them where they are and take them somewhere. I would say, in addition to learn, know, understand, appreciate, and respect where they're coming from, and that'll be a catapult to success for any. Uh, first year music educator. Yeah, that's really excellent advice. And that's something that's really practical and important. I remember, I think I mentioned it earlier in the episode, but you and I met in um, Clifford Matson's um, college teaching course at yes. Florida State. And do you remember he always did that exercise where he would do the yeah, but? Yeah. You know, you'd give an opinion and then you'd say, yeah, but, you know, right. to, to kind of be flexible and to build that sort of the idea of flexibility into your, your opinions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really Correct. valuable bit of uh, teaching. It it really is because it 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 really suggests that we should always keep our minds open. There is never a definitive yes or no to really any given challenge, but there are some best possible choices that one can make. Um, and I I also feel strongly that 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 college teaching class. I wish that everyone in the nation could take Cliff Matson's college teaching course uh, because it really does stretch one's mind into thinking more broadly. I, 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 I use a, a pretty much this aviation um, idea when I'm trying to describe this to my students or other professionals. Do you have the 10,000 foot view of music education or the 30,000 foot view or the 60,000 foot view. And, and quite often we're caught between 10 and 20 uh, when we are, when as educators, we're more uh, focused on the day-to-day -day challenges um, than looking at the overall picture of what we should do as educators to uh, actually encourage and inspire other young people. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you think is the 60,000 foot view in your opinion? Is in my opinion, it's understanding that creating the most diverse and inclusive access for all, everyone's welcome music environment is the most appropriate. It is for us, whether we're band, chorus, orchestra, elementary, general music teachers, whatever we're doing is to look at our school population in our community and create a philosophy of welcoming all into our community and, and, and creating a passion, a love, a sustainable passion and appreciation for music and the art. Uh, this is why, for example, we have uh, very, very wealthy people out there in the world who donate mil tens of millions of dollars to the arts to our programs. But also, Mark, this is why we have community orchestras, community choirs, community bands. I have several octogenarians in my group. I have two people who are in their early 90s in my community band, and they are excellent musicians, and they love it, and they want to 
to participate in music making for until they leave the world. And that is the passion that we must, as educators, instill in everyone. Everyone that we that we are in contact with, our students, our administrators, our community members. That's the 60,000 foot view, Mark. How do we do that? Well, what we have to first think about doing is not labeling ourselves as band directors, choral directors, uh, orchestra directors, elementary teachers. We're all music educators. And music educator, uh, you know, the term in my mind means that we're out to share the value and to share historical information, excuse me, to share um, the importance of music in a person's life to everyone. See, it transcends teaching in the classroom. It's everything, everyone we're in touch with. Um, uh, next week at the, at the Midwest Conference, I've, I've been told that I'll have a few minutes to uh, speak after my award uh, next Wednesday night. And this is one quick thing that I'm going to talk about, the importance of diversity in life in music education and lifelong participation in music education. You know, that to me should be everyone's purpose from K through 20 and beyond. Yeah, that's excellent advice. And so I buried the lead a little bit in this interview. Um, I was saving it, but you just mentioned it. You are a recipient of the Midwest Clinic Medal of Honor this year. Yes, sir. And I have no idea how that happened. And I will accept graciously. But as our dear colleague and mentor, Dr. Clifford Matson, Florida State University, always says, there are always more deserving. There are always equally people of equal uh, ability who deserve uh, the same honor. And I truly believe that. So I will be accepting that award, Mark, on behalf of all of us and not John Southall, but on behalf of all of us in music education. Well, John, I'm going to speak for my listeners because I think we'd all agree that we understand why you're receiving the award. Your humility, <laughs> your humility is is um, exceptional and humbling and inspiring. So, thank you. Um, yeah, you're receiving that award with um, Mr. Watkins, Alfred Watkins. Yes, and Alfred Watkins um, is a dear colleague, and um, he. Uh, was a phenomenal uh, uh, instrumental music conductor, director at Lasseter High School in particular. He's at several high schools, but the work he did at Lasseter was just world-class, internationally renowned, a dear colleague, a dear friend, and I am so proud to receive uh, this award dur- during the same time period that he will receive his. Mm-hmm. But I can tell you, he's a world-class person. He's so wonderful. He's loved by all. Yeah. Um, and he is an outstanding educator. I mean, he's retired. I, I think he's been retired from last year for a few years, but he's still a driving force in the uh, music education community. And again, I honestly, I am in awe of his professionalism, of his kindness and his commitment to young people. He yeah. is still inspiring hundreds and hundreds of young people every single month. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations to you both. It's, it's well, thank exceptional, you. the careers that you've had. So, John, um, do you have any hard-earned lessons for young conductors, young directors? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> first, let me, there are a lot. Of course. Um, For many years, and this is going to be, I'm sure, I'm just saying that I think that probably this is going to be criticized, what I'm going to say, and I send my humblest apologies to everyone in advance, in advance. But in the beginning of my career, I was focused on having the most outstanding band program in, in the land, in the world, in the state, and my focus was completely on ensemble performance. I wanted to have the best bands. I wanted to get state superiors. I wanted to be a Midwest band clinic ensemble conductor. I wanted to do all of these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that it was well suited for me to want to aspire to do that. And I did. You know, we had the superior bands and all that. But the, but the bottom line was that, I, Mark, I lost my way four or five years into my career. And I forgot about something that was very important, and that is 
the student in their growth, growth in their life lessons, in their well-being uh, must transcend and be more important to me than the success of the performing ensemble. I then, through, and throughout my latter years as a high school band director, um, I was a, it became an advocate, for, for example, for students with disabilities, kids with disabilities. And so I would have students with physical challenges out on the, in the marching band who could march and step and who had trouble with uh, perhaps playing some of them with a consistent quality sound. They were allowed to march with our marching band, and they were wonderful, and they did the best they could, and we took them and performed wherever we performed. There was no discrimination, and, and, and they had these wonderful aesthetic experiences by being a part of us, and they were a part of our big family. Um, the other thing that I realized that, you know, I aspired to be one of the larger bands and to perform at our performance assessment to be the big band at the end of the assessment. I remember one year where we were there and we were marching, I don't know, over 200 and we were there, we performed and we were the last group at the very end. And I remember standing there when people were leaving after a performance and the mar- my marching band's there and we're trying to uh, line up to leave. And I thought, this is an interesting experience. You know, this is something, a goal that i Work, work to achieve in my career with marching band and, and basically empty stadium and we're leaving. And I, I really thought about that. And uh, it was, again, the beginning of me as a, as a music educator, understanding what, what are we really about or what should we be about as, as educators? And yes, assessment's important. Quality of ensemble is important. I still at the college or when I conduct honor bands or whatever I'm doing, I am always looking for to to uh, inspire the performers to perform with great sonority and, and passion and expression. But at the same time, at this point in my career, I'm more focused on how they're progressing as musicians and how they're progressing as people and what can I do to inspire them to be great musicians and great people in the world. Because we, we do as educators focus quite a bit on the, on the education side of things when we're, when we're working with students. We are superior teachers, many of us across the country. But uh, we don't always focus on the social aspects of a young person's uh, development, even at the collegiate level. And I feel strongly that the social part of a young person's development is as important as the academic. And now, again, as a college uh, person, I've seen lots of my former students go out and uh, the students who are extremely knowledgeable, they're extremely talented, and they have the social skills to work with parents and to work around student conflict, they are successful. The other students who have the same academic and musical abilities, but no social skills are almost never successful. So I want to ask you, because you mentioned about always focusing on the student well-being and focusing on creating the best sound. But, you know, competition is important in our field. You know, there's a, a large marching arts community. There's a lot of people who, who, who make that very important. And we know that music education got its start with competition. Where's the line between healthy and unhealthy? Well, well, I'll tell you something that, that I am a very, uh, even though I've never been involved in the administrative side, I'm a very strong supporter of Drum Corps International. Mm-hmm. Yep. And because I truly believe that all of those students um, are instilled with a sense of family, with a, a, working towards a goal together. It's not about the self, it's about the whole. And those are very, very health, healthy environments. I agree. Again, I am not against competitive events at all because, uh, quite frankly, that's the way of the world. Yeah. Uh, when we're interviewing for a job, we're in large competing to brand ourselves as the better and more qualified person. Um, and there are non-competitive uh, philosophies out also, which I am a part of. My programs were non-competitive at, at large, but I still believe 
that there is great value in both. And as far as the middle line, I think that that has to be determined by the individual music educator and in the situation that they're in. Uh, you know, in the in the Midwest, there are some uh, high school band programs that have the numbers and they're able to have two on top. Yeah. They're uh, to have the traditional, quote, y'all come band where anyone at the school can participate. And then for a select number through audition, a competitive group. There are other schools that are only competition, and there are other schools that are only uh, interested in seeing growth through a a festival or a a music performance assessment. And I think that they all hold a special place in our world. And I think that they, I mean, if you look at in the classical music world, how there are artist competitions that young people can participate and win tens of thousands of dollars. There are international violin competitions where the winners can, you know, a college student, age student could win hundreds of thousands of dollars. There are composition con- contests, you know this, mm-hmm. where there are cash prizes. You know, and these competitions can affect the person's financial bottom line. You know, I yeah. think that they're all important and I think they're all of value, Mark, as long as at the foundation of everything, the student is kept in mind, that it's about the student, that it's about, the, and yes, we are going to work at this, in this competition to win this event, but not at the sacrifice of any kid in any way, in any young person's growth. And again, I don't have any negative stories about either side. It's just simply that, uh, yes, as a as an aspiring music educator, first year teacher is going to you're going to have to decide if you're if you're director of a program where do, where do you want the folks to be to what direction? Uh, and I can tell you, there's there in some competitive marching programs, high school. There is more of a family, sense of family, sense of togetherness than in some programs that are not competitive. So it, 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 it never should one think that competitive anything is bad because that's untrue. It's good and it's healthy, but it's not for everybody, just as non-competitive programs are not for every school. And actually, Mark, I think that there should be a mutual respect from everyone, all sides, for everything that that we're doing with our program. And, you know, and that's another thing, too, where people get opinionated one way or the other, and that's when the Battlestar Galactica starts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you have a, a way of of really sort of bringing people together, I think. You know, this is this is controversial to some people, but you make it... You, you you just put it in a way that it isn't. It's just what it is. Right. And I really and appreciate that. And that's a really refreshing and honest way of looking at it. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate that. And and just please know that that's how I truly feel. I'm mm-hmm. I'm not improvising. No, on that. I understand I've been about that for my entire career, and I truly believe it. We talk about losing our way. We can lose our way in a big in a big sense, but we can also on the day to day basis lose touch with that that sixty thousand foot view. And I just was thinking about it while you were you were speaking earlier about how when I lose touch with what I want to do, it always comes back to putting my focus back on the students, and then I find my balance again. Yes, absolutely. Um, because when I, you know, it's the whole scenario of a con- here, here's 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 a, a stimulus stimulus transfer for all is the concert performance happens at the end of the performance. What happens, Mark? The conductor stands. Uh, on the podium or they will step down, face the audience, arms out, and take take a bow. So the perception uh, could be that, well, is it about the conductor or is it about the ensemble? Um, And and, and that's not a a reference that I'm making to insult anyone, by the way, but it's it's a very interesting thing to think about. Is it? And I'm not saying don't bow. I mean, it would be rude for you not to acknowledge the audience. But in that one moment of a of a performance, I always think about what is it really about? This great ensemble. Is it about me relishing the fact that I created this phenomenal sonority, marvelous, 
or is this about a group of really hardworking young people who were inspired through collaborative learning to make this performance absolutely wonderful? Again, I'm not saying don't, if you're a conductor, you do need to bow, acknowledge your audience. But I think about it a lot, Mark. I really do. I don't think you're the only one. I think the thought crosses all of our minds because it is really about the students and it's about the collaborative effort of the ensemble. I just conducted the other night and I thought about it when I bowed. In in a concert performance, and I think a couple of weeks ago, I did some uh, wind ensemble concert series. I think there were four concerts across three days. And I can tell you, Every time, at, at the end especially, I, I take the bow, I think about this, and I'm always very nervous about it. I mean, I wish one day I could have the courage to just have every member walk one at a time to the front of the stage. It would take 30 minutes and, and be acknowledged. <laughs> Yeah, it would, it would be take a while, though. Not really practical, I yeah. guess. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. practical right now. Right. How do you find work-life balance in a career as a music teacher? Well, it's it's very challenging. Um, uh, my wife is an elementary education person, but she's also a flute player. My wife Kelly, she uh, played um, as a college person professionally, gigs on the side, that sort of thing, and uh, and it's very difficult. You know, we've raised two daughters, and uh, now we have two granddaughters. A grandson and granddaughter, two grandchildren. And even now, it's it's just very difficult to have the balance between personal family and professional. But I have to tell you, Mark, that every time my professional gets out of balance, even in a single day, for example, yesterday where I had to conduct a wind ensemble at two graduations, and then I had community band that night, as I said earlier, well, from 7 a.m. until 1030 at night, I'm not home. I'm not available for my family to support. And it becomes quite a challenge. Um, And it has been my entire career. However, the importance of spending as much energy and as much time in balancing my personal life, my family life with my professional life makes me as a person happier, healthier, and my family is much more stable. We're all happy, but we're never happy when 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 Poppy is out and very very busy. And I, quite frankly, I'm not happy. So it, it is important to work again. Take as much energy as we put into being the best professional we can, a music educator, into our personal lives. It's it's it's, it's vital. It's important to our success. We, if we're only focused on our professional growth mark, it can prove to be a very unhappy life for us. And guess what? For our students. I face this a lot. I have two young children. And so I work some long hours sometimes. And, you know, as I left the door, my seven-year-old daughter said, you know, I can't wait to come home tonight. We're going to play. And I thought, oh, I'm going to be tired, but you know, I'm going to play no matter what. That's right. And the, you know, on a, Friday after work, uh, my wife and I either bi- visit with one daughter's uh, child or the others, and, and we're tired from working a full day. But uh, but the love and, and how young people can inspire and the, the sense of family and being loved is so important. It's yeah. so important. Isn't that the truth? Yes, sir. So, John, what are the challenges facing music education, and how can we best meet them? Well, I think our one, Mark, one of our biggest challenges is that we have to create more Mark Connors in our world of music education. Worldly people who go into the profession and they understand that I'm a great trumpet player. I'm a wonderful violinist. I have a beautiful, beautiful voice. I'm a, a wonderful vocalist. But my mission is to inspire all to bring like a magnet everyone in my school environment into my program. You see, that is the, you know, if we look at the numbers, for example, even in the state of Florida, uh, you know, we see a statistical decline in the number of students who are in orchestra programs, who are involved in band programs, who are involved in choral programs. Uh, we see uh, on the elementary level, uh, 
administrations. We have over 60 school districts in Florida, uh, school district administrations who have tried to reshape what an elementary music experience is. You know, kids who only get 20, 25 minutes a week of music instruction. Um, and we have to continue to inspire a more worldly uh, a view of music participation in order to survive as a profession, you see? And, and it's, what's interesting to me is that some of the people around the country who have very large programs and they have lots and lots of me, uh, students involved, um, they are doing very, very well and they're not, re- not as concerned as those who are in uh, rather dire straits with involvement. But I wrote an article for the Florida Music Director uh, last year entitled Diversity in Music Education. Why should we care? And I wrote this article to hopefully inspire people to understand that no matter how strong their program is, how outstanding, the importance for them to inspire others and to help others in the profession to develop outstanding programs with as many students as possible is of paramount importance because the number of prominent large enrollment instrumental uh, or or vocal programs in the even across the country they're declining for many reasons. You know, for example, Mark, when I was a kid in the '60s, we only had three television stations. You know, we only had in American culture. There were a limited number of musical genres, and now look at where we are. You know, you can't say rock and roll without people saying, wait, there are 20 subcategories. <laughs> yeah, isn't that there the truth? There are so many choices. We have a, a, the uh, technology has advanced in the last 60 years more than it's done in the last 200 years. If, if we can think it, if we want it, we have access to it through Internet. Um, so there are more... Uh, not necessarily distractions. There are more choices for young people these days. And and as prof- as music educators, we have to look at that very seriously and understand that we have to be in order to to keep our vitality, to retain our value, to inspire people. We we to be relevant in the world of education. We have to inspire absolutely everyone to be a part of our program. And and unfortunately, for those who are focused on just having a superior ensemble, uh, that's not going to be enough in the future. Um, you know, I know some, they shall be nameless, of course, colleagues who have, uh, you know, in, 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 in 15 years, they've been to 12 different schools in search of the most outstanding uh, program that they can inspire to go even further. And, and they many of them have lost their way. Some of them have realized that and they're coming back. Um, but in Florida, we receive, when we pass the teacher certification exam, we get a certificate of, of, of success that says music education K through 12, whether we're band, choral, or orchestra focused, Elementary, it said it says music education K twelve is our certification. Which again, my thinking is that if we are music educators, then we should have this worldly degree. If our if our certification were banned, and maybe in some states it's like that, so I'm not claiming you know knowledge of any other state. Uh, that might be a different story. But if K twelve music educator. Uh, music education in Florida, it, it simply means that we have a very broad certificate. And, and But my thinking, Mark, is that we should be worldly people. As a high school director, I should, if, if I choose, be permitted to teach at an elementary school and really learn and grow and be successful. And in, in this state, you can do that if you choose. But if we all had this worldly view, and then our profession would continue to grow. Now, I will tell you this, that my philosophy has, even in the past, been met with extreme criticism because people, folk generally, uh, people I've known, tend to focus on the, the cannot 
they cannot, what they can't do, what their challenges are. But my response is that everyone has challenges in the profession. You know, even the large program uh, music uh, educators have major issues. You know, no one ever realizes that is that if you have 300 students involved in your music program, then you have 300 sets of parents and 300 opportunities for challenges. So, <laughs> John, that's an extraordinary answer. Um, what advice would you give your younger self? My younger self would, if, if I could advise my younger self, I would say, realize the following, John Southall, younger person. You do not have all of the answers. Open your mind. Listen to people. You know the old, old, old thought, Mark, about how people who don't really listen are constantly thinking about how they're going to respond when you're talking to them? Yeah. Well, I would tell the old John Southall, listen more than you speak. The old Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, speak to understand and never make a decision. Get this, never make a decision unless I absolutely have all of the background information. You know, my first two or three years teaching, I had knee-jerk responses to everything. If something happened, I was on top of it with the answer or with how I wanted to proceed or what I wanted to do and with little or no background information about the why is this happening, who is causing it, what is causing it, where is this going, what are possible implications, intention, function. My intention as a young educator did not function uh, in many situations well because I hadn't carefully thought uh, about it. Another thing that I would do is to strongly consider the importance of social with academic. And uh, by the way, of course, I will say this, since this is a podcast, I don't mean to go out and socialize with the students or parents, simply social meaning not without asking very many questions, trying to understand what student's social environment is, understanding when they're together as a class or an ensemble, they need a little time to just say, my name is, kind of get to know each other, creating a family environment, not anything inappropriate, by the way, not anything after school weekend, not anything off the school campus, but within the confines of our classroom, creating a strong social environment where the students can interact and learn about each other's cultures and values. Um, and of course, that helps us as a world, as, as, uh, as a society. Um, but if I could look back on my old self, I would focus that. And, and one last thing, Mark, is that uh, I was very hard on myself personally. And to a degree, I am that way even now. Uh, this award that is being bestowed on me, I still, to this second, don't believe that I deserve it. Uh, cannot believe that I'm being honored in this way. Uh, even for months, I've been, it, it, this is, you'll laugh at this, I've been asking my wife, is this real? In September, I called the Midwest uh, executive office and I said, I'm just checking. And of course, they were laughing hysterically. Am I receiving an award in December? I said, I know someone called me in January, but but that is who I am, Mark. But but if if I could go back and just give myself credit at, to a degree and say that you're allowed to make a decision that did not function well, it's a part of the growth process. It's part of you as a young educator growing. We are going to make lots of decisions that are not going to be the best decision. And note that I'm not saying mistake, because I don't want to use that word, Mark. Oh, you made a mistake. But we make decisions that are not may not necessarily be the best. And I would basically uh, be devastated when I made a decision uh, or did something with good intentions that did not function well. I blamed myself. My self-esteem went down five or six notches. It took me too long to recover emotionally. And um, I think that if, as a young person, if uh, it, and a young educator, or I don't, I don't want to say young first or second year educator, understand that there are so many unknowns that you're going to have to make decisions about 
And if they're not the best decision, then you will survive. You will work your way out with diplomacy, with professionalism, but don't punish yourself forever. I wish I could tell my younger self that. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're saying it because I could, I could use that lesson sometimes. <laughs> you know, I just made a misstep the other night with a colleague and I didn't do it intentionally at all. And, and it, it's, I thought right. about it for, for a couple of days for sure. All right, John. So we're getting close to the end here. And so I ask all of my guests and I used to ask, what was your favorite work for wind ensemble or band? But now I ask if you had a chance to choose your final work to conduct, what would it be? Oh my God. The last work <laughs> that you do. Oh, and not in a morbid way, not in a morbid way. Just, you know, you, you know what? I, all right. I'll go out on the limb and say anything Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein, anything. Do you have any transcriptions or arrangements for band that you've done that you would recommend? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, why, because of his personality, because of who he was, and, and yes, of course, his, his, his writing band, he was the consummate musician, and, and, and just watching him on the podium was a delight in how he inspired people. But the, uh, I mean, just his music is, is such an inspiration to me and so many others. Um, I mean, let's see. I'm trying to think of what would be my favorite. Of course, uh, the Candide Suite, and I've conducted that several times. Um, that piece is absolutely wonderful. And I would say that that would be one of my uh, best uh, Bernstein uh, transcriptions to consider. Mm -hmm. I, actually, that I would conduct. That. All right. Excellent. Overture to Candide or the Candide Suite. There. Now I'm in trouble. Because millions of people of musicians will disagree and say, "Well, why didn't you choose this?" Well, I don't know. I don't know if you can go wrong. There's a there's a few music, American musicians of the 20th century that, to me, stand head and shoulders above the above the rest. Yeah. So nothing wrong with that answer at all, John. Um, so I mentioned that you're receiving the Medal of Honor at Midwest. What is that ceremony? What time and what day? Uh, it is going to be Wednesday night at 7 p.m. It's the Doc Severinsen concert. So I'm, I'm hoping that I will get the opportunity to maybe shake hands, meet Doc for a second. And as you know, Mark, uh, Doc is a pivotal, pivotal figure in the music world. And he ran the Tonight Show band oh, yeah. uh, with Johnny Carson when they, there was actually a live jazz oh, ensemble yeah. that really played and real musicians. <laughs> on television. So uh, it will be an honor to meet him and receive this award uh, uh, at the beginning of his concert. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I am. I hope you're there. Uh, will, will you be there? Will you be in town for that? I, I hope I will there. be. I will be at the clinic. Um, I am not sure if I will be at the Doc Severinsen concert. There's a couple things. That's um, the publisher dinner is that evening as well. Well, well, if you're not there, I will call you and spend hours in glowing detail telling you verbally about what happened. <laughs> stop, stop by the Barnhouse booth. I'll be there and um, oh, say definitely, hi. Definitely. I'm, I, I will be there. And I am truly honored, Mark, that you would even consider me for this program. Uh, and I, I seriously, I appreciate the, the fact that you are asking me to do this. And I hope that that the listeners will find some value in what I'm sharing. Oh, I'm sure they will. John, this is an exceptional interview. You're an exceptional, exceptional man and very inspiring. So Thank you. the praise is well-deserved. So last Thank thing, you. how can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, my email address, very simple, John Southall, J-O-H-N-S-O-U-T-H-A-L-L -L at me.com, M-E dot C-O-M. That's the best way to contact me, and, and I will most certainly, in a reasonable time period, respond to anyone with any questions or thoughts, love to communicate with, with anyone about the profession. Uh, I will confess, though, that I, I truly believe no one person has all the answers in our profession, and I don't, uh, but if you care uh, to, if you'd like my opinion about something, I'd certainly love to correspond with you. All right, John, this has been a terrific interview. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And I look, All right. I look forward to seeing you next week. Yes, sir. And happy holidays to you and everyone. And you as well. Thank you, John. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.